Well, hey, all of you sheepies near and far, welcome to worship whenever you have a chance to view this. Today is November 14th, 2021. Today we're looking at the prophet Amos, one of our minor prophets, and maybe one that we haven't heard of all that much. And so if you have your Bible handy, I would ask that you would uh, turn to Amos. He, after the Psalms, after Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and see if you can't find Amos and, and follow along. Our message title for today is Oceans of Justice, Rivers of Righteousness. So Amos was the kind of guy, or he was the prophet that called out Israel's injustice and oppression. And so as we travel along today, we'll, we'll learn about that. But, but think about some injustices and oppression in our world today. All you have to do is turn on the news uh, to find those and be thinking about how God can use you as a change agent, just like the prophet Amos. So let me pray us in. God, today you teach us about the prophet Amos. Just an ordinary guy called by God to call out injustices and oppression and evil in whatever forms they present themselves. And so help us to have hearts and minds to just see people as you see them and to call out those that uh, are oppressing people. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, today we do take a look at the prophet Amos. We looked at Amos uh, a few years ago here at Ballotin UMC. And before that, I don't think I ever preached on Amos. It's one of the reasons why I, as pastor, love to follow the narrative lectionary. Because we get to learn about certain Bible people that perhaps we would not have. And all of these prophets actually play a part in leading up to the birth and, and life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's important to know our biblical history. And it's great to have a recap for, for those who remember Amos. Amos, again, is one of our minor prophets, simply meaning what? As a minor prophet, he just gets more or less, or less biblical ink biblical press than a major prophet does. Amos was written somewhere around the 8th century, like 762 BC. He was a prophet from the southern kingdom of Judah. If we remember, we have the northern kingdom of Israel up here and the southern kingdom of Judah, Jerusalem, Zion. They all mean the same thing. It, it's the holy city. And God is going to send Amos up north to the northern kingdom of Israel because God is very displeased with the injustices that are taking place there. So our text opens with these words. The word of Amos, one of the shepherds, shepherds of Tekoa, what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was on the throne in Judah, southern kingdom, and Jeroboam was king on the throne up north in Israel. So scripture tells us who was in power at the time. And it's interesting that the word shepherd here in the original Hebrew means sheep breeder or sheep owner rather than shepherd, as in one who tends the flock. And so it tells us Amos was probably, as my grandma used to say, Amos probably had a few nickels. He was wealthy, probably, and it's important to our text. So then once we are introduced to Amos, as well as our historical, historical content, we move into the main reason why God calls Amos. And what's the main reason? Well, God is angry. God is angry at the injustice and oppression that is taking place. Do you think God is, is angry about the injustices and oppression 
that are taking place in today's world? I would say yes. So then we hear God roar. We hear God roar. That's what it tells us. He's roaring from Zion. I listed it in our study guide for those that are in church asking, what is the difference between a roar and a shout? What do you think? What's the difference between a roar and a shout? Sometimes we see that in scripture that, that God is shouting from Zion or a prophet is shouting from Zion. But here, God is roaring. God is roaring. Keep that in mind as we talk today. Remember, God is angry. God sees all of these injustices that are going on, and God is more than miffed. God roars from Zion. And whenever we hear the word Zion, we remember it is the southern kingdom of Judah. It is Jerusalem. It is the holy city. This is where the prophet Amos is, and God is sending him on up north to northern Israel to tell the people to knock it off. That's our context. It tells us that God sends a drought. The pastures of the shepherd dry out here. Shepherd refers to the kings because King Jeroboam up in the northern kingdom is not worshiping God with a capital G. And so with the mere sound of God's voice, think about this now, with the mere sound of God's voice, the pastures dry up, both the physical pastures, which of course means that the livestock can't eat because there's no grass, that is gone now because there's no moisture, and the creek bed also dries up, so the cattle can't drink. Poof, no cattle, no income which also means no T-bone steaks for the king. But it also refers to something else. The Northern Kingdom's army has just defeated the Armenians. So there's been a military conquest and the king and those in, in power are whooping it up because they've just defeated the Armenians. There's a case of arrogance going on. But this arrogance, it will not last long because the Assyrians, another powerhouse, another mighty army is waiting in the wings to come knock Israel off their high horse. And all God is going to have to do is give a whistle, give a whistle, God will send in the Assyrian army by God's command, by God's design. God will send in the Assyrian army. Bad boy, and the Assyrians were bad boys. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do when they come for you? This will be God's punishment for Israel's blind eye to the injustices that are happening in their own backyard. God has been warning them. You need to take care of the people. You need to share the wealth. You need to quit hoarding hoarding your, your resources, and the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. This is the context here. These are injustices. They're social injustices. So as our text opens, we hear God roar because he's displeased with all of this stuff, and we hear the earth moaning in grief. Can you picture this imagery? The pastures are drying up, the creek is drying up. The cattle are drying or, or dying. The earth is moaning. The earth is moaning because God's people were being stupid. Really, they were. Really, I wonder when God is going to completely cut loose and give a roar in today's world because of the similarities of the injustices and oppressions that are going on in today's world. So we scoot on over here now to chapters two through four, if you're following along as your Bibles are open. Chapters two through four gives us indication of just some of the injustices that has God angry. Things such as forced slavery, sexual sins, especially against young girls. There's an incest sort of relations going on. 
I know, ick, right? Both father and sons were having sexual relations with the same young girl, probably their own daughter or sister even. There was this also rampant economic abuse and just plain injustice towards the least, the lost, and the left out. We can think of sexual trafficking, similar. I'm not going to go through them, but I hope you read through them on your own because here we get a whole bunch of stanzas that of thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord stanzas after each named injustice. God's calling them out. Thus says the Lord after each individual injustice. This is about the haves versus the have nots of society. The rich are living in houses made of ivory, it says. And Amos warns them that their houses of ivory, they're going to fall. They're going to fall. If our possessions make a statement about who we are, what do you think our possessions are saying? Well, my possessions might say that I watch a lot of movies, I listen to a lot of music, and I read a lot of books. Then there's our cell phones. I've seen people wait in line overnight sometimes. You've seen that on the news for the latest and greatest cell phone, for the newest iPhone, or other things, other material things that, you know, what do you think our things are saying about us? something to consider. We also see that those in power even forced the preachers to party. I'm not kidding. They got the preachers drunk. And I kind of chuckled at that part, but it's really not that funny. So let me unpack that for us. Here in chapter 2, verse 12, it tells us that. It tells us, you made the Nazarenes drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. So here is what that means. We have this, this power grid of sorts. The king, the state, and then we have the Nazarenes. Nazarenes showed their dedication to serving God by abstaining from alcohol. For one thing, John the Baptist was a Nazarene. But the king, who pretty much laughed in the face of God with a capital G, had more power over the pastor. The state had more power over the pastor. Well, the king used that power to get the preachers drunk. It was, you either drink this wine or I will kill you. Same with the prophets. The king silenced them, except for Amos. But Amos, Amos' speaking out was risky, wasn't it? We need to understand that he could have been put to death at any time. And yet, here is Amos, this average guy, this average farmer, a fig farmer, actually. Sycamore trees had figs on them. So think about your fig newtons. And God sends him to call out power. Risky business. I'm sure we all have been aware of the news cycle Lately, there were the result of sexual sins of many in power have come out of the darkness and into the light. We've seen that. And do you think that the sins of those in power have a trickle-down effect for everyone else? Of course they do. You better believe it. There's always a cause and effect. The haves versus the have-nots. The have-nots are affected by the sins of the haves, you see. So people in Israel were starving to death. They were starving to death while those in power lived in houses of ivory. And in the midst of all of this stuff, here God sends Amos, a shepherd, to call out power. Don't you just want to raise your hand for the job of a prophet? Not so much. Amos is called by God to be a change agent, as prophets are. 
They are called to be this mouthpiece for God, and prophets rarely bring good news, but they always bring news of change. Prophets call out an injustice on God's behalf and give the people an opportunity to change or not, an opportunity for life-giving or to live as spiritually dead. This call is to wake up. God is condemning Israel's ruling class, those in power in the north, for their oppressive treatment of the poor and the needy members of society. Amos warns that if they don't shape up and return to God, there's going to be this military conquest that could totally destroy them. If they're not going to change, this military army will force them out of power, you see? To wipe them out. The Assyrians did invade the northern kingdom as well as the southern kingdom of Judah about 10 years later. But in the meantime, Amos's hope for them changing their ways, it's pretty thin. It's pretty thin. But the only hope is for them to return to the Lord. Now scoot on over to chapter 5 here, beginning with verse 14. Here we get God's call through Amos. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord Almighty will be with you. Hate evil, love good, and maintain justice in the courts. Those of us who are United Methodists, who does this remind us of? John Wesley. It reminds us of John Wesley. Do all the good you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. United Methodist Social Principles at their best. As we think about people who have been prophetic voices in past and present, John Wesley was among them, as was our Lutheran counterpart, Martin Luther. But Martin Luther King Jr. often quoted the prophet Amos, often in his pursuit of civil liberties. He quoted this passage about this ever-flowing stream in his I Have a Dream speech. Down to verse 24, chapter 5. God is not only displeased with the injustice, he is also displeased with the hypocrisy of worship. He is displeased with the people just going to church, singing the songs, putting their checks in the offering plate, and then walking out the door and doing living the same old, same old. God doesn't want us to live the same old way. God wants us to be life givers. God wants us to live as life givers. Because when we live that way, we act that way. We become in tune with the injustice around us. We, we become aware of the injustices around us. And then we are called to do something about it, not just turn a blind eye. When we are called to action, we let justice flow like an ever-flowing stream. In other words, we bring life-giving water to dry places of life of our own lives and to other people, to the world around us. So as Martin Luther King Jr. is preaching with an audience of mainly folks from the South, places like Mississippi and Alabama, places where streams ran slow. Martin Luther King Jr. used a different translation in his speech that referenced let justice flow like mighty streams. Let justice flow like mighty streams. By using the word mighty, it stressed the urgency of the call for reformation, you see. As we think about our world, as we think about the news cycle, we can name so many injustices. I hope you can. So how are we then called to act? We might think, but I'm just a little fish in a big ocean, but we aren't. 
No act of justice in God's name is insignificant. You are not insignificant, friends. We can start by prayer. We can start by prayer. We can not only attend worship, but live differently when we leave worship. We can send a card in the mail. We can buy some diapers for a family with young children. We can send a grocery or a gas card as you might see or know a family that might just need a little bit of a boost, especially as the holidays are coming. We all know that prices are going up everywhere. If you can help, do. Or perhaps an elderly person on a fixed income. Many are having to pay for prescriptions and perhaps not eating the healthiest. There's colds and, and stuff going around, not just COVID, but also just viruses. Perhaps bring some orange juice or Gatorade or bottled water or even a can of soup and some crackers. Just thoughts, just thoughts. I've spoken with many of my clergy colleagues recently at different gatherings and we've all echoed that people simply aren't coming back physically to our houses of worship. And it's not just the Methodist denomination. Many of whom I've talked to have echoed this. And it's hard for we pastors not to take that personally. It's hard for us not to take it personally. We internalize, well, perhaps if I just use more video clips than my sermons, maybe if I made the sermon longer or shorter or added this or that, etc., etc., etc. You know? But what if instead we simply prayed, God, I'm not sure what you are up to here during this time of pandemic our economy, our worship, but I will follow you faithfully. Use me for whatever this new thing that you are doing in my life and in, our, in the life of our community and our nation, in our world. Help me to see myself, first of all, as you see me. And then help me to see my neighbor as you see them. If there are changes that need to be made inside of me, wash me clean so that I may be used for your kingdom now and the one to come. Help me then. Help me, God. Call out injustice. Help me to call out injustice and oppression and do something about it in whatever way you call me to. Help me to spread your word and not worry so much about in-house numbers of the church house, but rather about people near and far knowing you first. This is my prayer, Lord, offered to you. Amen. And when we begin to think and act as such, the water starts to run. And it keeps on flowing, never ending. And those dry places begin to bring life, new life, perhaps. And so it begins with us. Let us bring oceans of justice and rivers of mercy to all places. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that was more of a teaching sermon today on the prophet Amos, but I hope it got you thinking about some of the oppression and injustices around us. And how can we be change agents in, in our world, within our families, within our communities, within our nation, within, within our world? Thanks for joining in today. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.